This video was sponsored by The Great Courses Plus. Go to thegreatcoursesplus.com today to start your free trial. In the previous episode of this series, we covered the evolution of ancient Greek naval warfare during the two Persian invasions. This video will be dedicated to the changes brought to Greek warfare by the Peloponnesian Wars. The Persian withdrawal brought some changes to the Hellenic world, but most importantly, it significantly contributed to the steady empowerment of two significant city-states, Sparta and Athens. Each of the two was now able to develop its traditions free from external threats and continue their dominance as the leaders of the Hellenic world. The Spartans were never the most innovative regarding new developments in hoplite warfare. What made them great soldiers were their incredible levels of discipline and constant training in shield wall tactics, as well as a strong sense of duty, the attribute which sustained a Spartan formation's cohesiveness and effectiveness. This is reflected in the high value of the shield in Spartan military life. It is not as serious for a soldier to lose his spear or his sword. However, a hoplite returning from combat without his shield would be called Ripsaspis, the one who abandons his shield, and would be considered a deserter and a coward. It is not a coincidence that history remembers what Spartan mothers told their sons when they left for war either with the shield or on it. Also, Spartans trained in Pancration, an ancient form of fighting consisting of boxing and wrestling. In fact, they were so good at it that they were not allowed to compete in this particular sport during the Olympic Games. On the other hand, Athens, which had a conscription military with a service length of two years, mostly focused on developing its navy, as well as its ranged units with the incorporation of Cretan archers, Rhodesian slingers and eventually native Athenian peltists into the state army. Initially, a coalition led by Athens, called the Delian League, was formed to ensure that the Persians would not return and also to fill the power vacuum in Greece, Asia Minor and the Aegean Sea. Athens essentially became an empire during this period, with a formidable navy, vassals and overseas colonies. In contrast, Sparta's influence was restricted to the Peloponnese, mostly due to Spartan reluctance towards campaigning too far from their capital. But their coalition, the Peloponnesian League, was also a formidable force, which emerged victorious from a long series of conflicts between the two leagues in the 5th century BC called the Peloponnesian War. During this era, warfare occurred on a much larger scale than in the Archaic period, and became a much more industrialized and professional affair. For instance, the designs of the Hoplite shields became simplified to avoid incidents similar to the Battle of Delium in 424 BC, when some Athenian Hoplites mistakenly clashed among themselves. The Spartans adopted the Greek letter Lambda, which referenced their home province, Lacedaemon, while the Thebans decorated their shields with their national symbol, a club. Evidence indicates that prominent city-states such as Athens provided their armies with shields and weapons upon the completion of their training. Up until then, the Hoplites were expected to bring their own into battle. In the conflict now occurring between the Greeks, Despite the introduction of new units to the battlefield, phalanxes still clashed on numerous occasions. Aeschylus mentions that the spear shaft would typically break during the first blows, forcing the hoplites to draw swords. Plutarch states that skill rather than strength was required when the spear fighting, Doritismos, was over, since the fighting transitioned to man-to-man -man combat. It is, therefore, safe to assume that many battles, especially those long in duration, were finalized with sword fighting. Moreover, warfare escaped the small-scale ritualistic type of combat, annulling the rules of war that were established in the previous centuries. This usually gave rise to negative results, such as the Athenian invasion of the island of Melos in 416 BC, which was meant to serve as a punishment for remaining neutral in the war. Javelin throwers, Acontistae, Slingers, Svendonistae and Archers, Toxotai, 
were conscripted or recruited assembled as mercenaries, while the Peltists, originating from Thrace, were hired initially as mercenaries until the city-states gradually started to train their native citizens in that fashion. Slingers had greater range than archers, with approximately 300 meters for slingers and 150 meters for archers. The best slingers were the Rhodesians. When Xenophon wanted to establish a slinger military unit, he asked all of his hoplites from Rhodes to throw the spear away and pick up the sling, since it was taken for granted that they knew how to handle it. The Peltists' name was derived from the shape of their shield, which was roughly a crescent. They were lightly armoured, often wearing fabric instead of metal armour to be more agile. They would repeatedly attack the phalanx formations and then retreat. This tactic took advantage of the light unit's speed and maximised enemy casualties while it minimised the Peltus' losses. The Battle of Sphactria in 425 BC was the most significant achievement of this particular group when Athenian Peltists under Ephicrates managed to annihilate a 600-man Spartan unit called a Mora and imprisoned the survivors, marking the first ever defeat of the Hoplites at the hands of the light infantry. After that defeat, Spartans started hiring mercenary archers and also invested in some cavalry. Peltists were also excellent scouting troops and very capable during sieges and ambushes. In response to the threat from ranged light infantry, city-states started training lightly armoured hoplites, the Ekdromai, who would act like regular hoplites but were also able to leave the formation momentarily and keep the peltists and other light infantry units at bay. These hoplites could also attempt to either outflank the enemy formation or even jump over the first rows of the enemy phalanx to harass and spread panic. They were usually armed with a sword and shield when attempting to penetrate the enemy spear wall. Cavalry was also gradually being introduced during the 5th century BC, partly due to its effectiveness against light infantry, but also because of its multifaceted use. It could scout, harass and flank. The best horsemen could traditionally be found in Thessaly and Macedonia. Athens used to hire mercenary cavalry from Thessaly until the Battle of Tanagra, when the Thessalians changed sides and inflicted heavy casualties on the Athenian armies with their cavalry. After that, Athens started training their own horsemen and maintained a 1,000-strong cavalry force. Other city-states also began recruiting and training their own cavalry, such as Boeotia and Sparta. It has to be mentioned that the cavalry from Magna Graecia in modern-day Sicily and South Italy was among the best. The tyrant of Syracuse, for example, maintained a force of 1,200 horsemen, the famous Tarentine cavalry, deriving from the ancient region of Taurus, the modern-day Taranto. This particular force inflicted devastating losses to the Athenian armies during the Sicilian expedition. Cavalry in ancient Greece generally started with light armour. However, it was gradually upgraded with heavier armour through the years, reaching a point where a horseman would look like a hoplite on a horse, in contrast with the actual hoplite unit, which was being equipped with lighter armour in order to make the phalanx a more agile and manoeuvrable force. While creating this documentary, we used the series of lectures called Understanding Greek and Roman Technology from Professor Stephen Ressler, provided by the sponsor of this video, The Great Courses Plus. This very detailed 24-part series covers the most important inventions and technologies of antiquity, and is essential if you want to learn more about the technology of the ancients. You can subscribe to The Great Courses Plus to get access to the vast library of over 10,000 lectures on history, science, literature and other subjects from the top-notch professors from the best universities in the world. The Great Courses Plus is giving viewers a great offer of a free trial. Show your support to our channel and learn more about Greek and Roman technology by subscribing to The Great Courses Plus through thegreatcoursesplus.com forward slash kings and generals or the short link in the description. 
Thank you for watching our documentary covering the evolution of ancient Greek warfare during the Peloponnesian Wars. In our next video, we will talk about siege warfare. We would like to thank our Patreon supporters who make the creation of these videos possible. Also, Patreon is the best way to suggest a new video, learn about our schedule and so much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel and we will catch you on the next one.